so fly and fly. Welcome to X Squared Radio. I'm your host, Brooks Agnew. This is a special for Sci-Spy TV on the Inner Earth Expedition. This is part one, the space-based evidence. You know, when I first got involved with the Hollow Earth Expedition, I contacted Stephen Curry, who was then leading the expedition in the spring of 2006. And I was pretty excited about it because a lot of evidence had been collected, had been thought about, had been written about, but most of it was personal testimony or um, introspection or intuition. And we really didn't have a lot of scientific evidence. So I thought, well, gee, wouldn't it be great to join an expedition, be part of something and really make a good scientific exploration one way or the other. Unfortunately, in the summer of 2006, uh, Stephen Curry passed away. And so the expedition kind of came to an end. Later that fall, the board contacted me and said, would you like to lead the expedition? So I said, let me think about it for about a month. So I did. And I got back to them and said, okay, I'll lead it. But we're going to have to change things a little bit. Not for me, but for the integrity of the expedition. Instead of selling seats to a lot of rich tourists, we decided to put on a good scientific expedition using the scientific method. So we uh, started to look at some of the evidence, and of course it was in several categories. This is the first of those categories, which is the space-based data. Now, I guess the first event that really took place that got not just... Uh, single scientists like myself interested, but institutional scientists interest, interested was a photograph or an image of Earth that was taken from space. It looked a little like this. Instead of the aurora existing over one pole or the other, depending on whether it was winter or summer, uh, we noticed that there were auroras over both poles at the same time. This was quite anomalous. It was not what we expected. Maybe a little bit of reflection, maybe a little bit of spillover as the solar wind or solar flares or energetic particles coming from the sun passed around the magnetosphere and maybe came in on both poles, but not to the extent that we were seeing it. It got everyone excited. And so JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratories in Pasadena, California, decided to put together what's called the Themis uh, program. This was a, a nose cone, and inside of the nose cone was situated five satellites. They uh, accomplished a launch engine, put the nose cone on there in pretty short order, I might add, and uh, launched the satellites out into orbit. When they got out into space, they assumed five different orbits. You can see them spread along here in this slide. Um, Basically, we had five different orbits stacked from Earth going out into uh, maybe several hundred miles into space. And what occurred when these satellites were going around Earth at different speeds is occasionally they would line up. When they would line up, they'd start up the program and try to run the satellites and take measurements to see where the energy was coming from that was responsible for the auroras over both poles at the same time. And what occurred while the experiment was running, so the paper goes, is a cosmic bullet. You can see this bright spot here in between uh, satellites three and four. And so what happened was, as the shock wave from this cosmic bullet went passing out into space and went toward Earth, it passed each satellite, was measured in sequence, and when it struck the Earth, there appeared the aurora. And so they issued their report that the auroras were caused by cosmic bullets. That was it. That was the report. One event. I wasn't buying it. Neither was anyone else. There was a lot more to be done. There were more explanations as to why these auroras 
were appearing independent of solar wind, independent of solar flares, independent of coronal mass ejections. They weren't necessarily coming from the sun. They were coming from some other source. We took other wavelengths of pictures of the Earth, as you can see in this. We took an infrared image of the Earth, and lo and behold, there was this IR energy not coming from the sun, but coming from Earth. Infrared energy was jetting out of the poles of the Earth, and Earth was not the only planet doing it. We also photographed similar patterns of energy coming from Saturn. You can see this hexagonal shape on the pole of Saturn. We also noticed it on Venus. There's another image of the auroras on both poles of Saturn. Kind of interesting that this the energy to excite the atoms in the upper atmosphere in our uh, on our planets the ionosphere on other planets it's just their atmosphere. As these electrons get excited to higher energy states, they fall back to lower energy states, and when they do, they emit a photon, and that's exactly what we're seeing in these auroras over both poles at the same time. It's clear that this energy is coming from inside the planet. When we think about this, it gives us a clear picture of this rotational energy that may be coming from inside the planet and exciting these electrons and these atoms in the upper atmosphere. This is really important to know because if the planet itself is hollow and it has a core on the inside that is spinning very quickly relative to the crust, then it is operating somewhat like a giant motor, more correctly, like a giant generator. And when it's generating this magnetic force, this magnetic flux, it is jetting out of the north and south poles, exciting the uh, ions in the upper atmosphere and making them emit light. This is the space-based data for the hollow earth hypothesis. Now, what I'm going to do is continue this in part two when we go over the seismic evidence. These are nice, short, compact videos for you to enjoy more about the North Pole Inner Earth Expedition. I'm your host, Brooks Agnew. This is X Squared Radio with the Potential of All Potentialities channel on Size by TV. Thanks for being with us.